Dear students, welcome to e -part Sala. Today's module is about conceptualizing globalization, contested characters of globalization. I am Dr. Rakesh Thakur, Associate Professor in Postgraduate Government College, Sector 11, Chandigarh. And during the course of this module, I would make you understand how to develop a conceptual clarity about the term globalization. To begin with, let me tell you that there is no one way of understanding globalization. Globalization is a historical process. It has a lineage and thus different social scientists have looked at globalization through differently. To keep it brief, we would be in today's module talking about world system analyst, world polity theory, network society, transnationalism and world city theory. It is through these five perspectives we would try and locate and understand the contested character of globalization. The world system analysis was propounded by Immanuel Wallerstein to explain the start of globalization as a phenomenon which originated in the 16th century in Europe and culminated in the 20th century. By culmination, it is meant that the globalization process has spread to almost all the countries of the world which are linked to one another through the world economy. In the 16th century, Europe was growing through a crisis of the base and superstructure. The feudal system, which was the economic base on which the European superstructure was built, was on its way out. The reason for the gradual decline of feudalism included the unfairness of the system in which the peasants had to provide the surpluses on the land they tilled to the landlord in return for living and working on it. The increased wars in which Europe had engaged at this time due to which the peasants had to work hard to produce more surplus for the maintenance of the feudal aristocracy and the army and finally natural conditions such as changing climate and an outbreak of bubonic plague which killed several thousands and led to the migration from villages to the nearby towns of many former peasants, landlords and others. At the same time, the superstructure was going through its own crisis with a conflict between the church and the feudal princes over the issue of power. With the edifice of the feudal base and superstructure crumbling, new modes of production started to make their way into Europe. The nascent feature of the new mode of production were the shift from subsistence and community-based farming to cash crop farming and wage labor. The beginning of an arts and handicraft economy in the urban center and the expansion of the European economy to other parts of the world for trade and conquest. With Northwest Europe taking the lead in consolidating these new modes of production, this region became economically, politically and militarily more advanced than the rest of the world during the 16th century. These advantages helped the Northwest European countries establish their gain vis-a-vis -vis the country with which they traded or which they conquered. One of the most important consequences of this new international trade in which Europe was engaged was the creation of a modern world system whose main feature was the geographic and occupational division of labor within the boundaries of the world economy. Wallerstein defined the world system as a unit with a single division of labor and multiple cultural system. He called it a historical system with a delineated structure bound by rules and consisting of parts that were economically interdependent. It was because of these features and the fact that it was bigger than any political unit that Wallerstein called the modern world system a world economy. The world economy is a type of social system called the world system. By social system in this case, the world system, Wallerstein meant a system having a common division of labor which linked its different parts in order to meet their economic needs. The modern world economy, which is a world system, has multiple political center 
and the unified cultural system. The world economy emerged in the 16th century in Northwest Europe, and with it, trade came to be conducted in the market. For Wallerstein, this is in a sense was the hallmark of the capitalist system. The world economy was capitalist because the underlying force which drove it was the principle of capital accumulation by means of extracting surpluses. To this end, people and good were commodified. The survival of the world system would not have been possible without the existence of multiple political center where the stronger government maneuvered and superimposed their interest on the weaker ones who subsequently submitted to a very unequal form of exchange which helped the world system itself to expand. When the modern world economy first emerged between the 16th and 18th centuries in Northwest Europe, agriculture produced was largely brought and sold in the world market. Wallerstein called this agricultural capitalism and wage labor as one of the modes of payment to the worker. Other forms of labor were peasant, sharecroppers, and slave. However, what was of significance here was that the different forms of labor control occurred in different regions of the world economy. Wallerstein called this the regional specialization in labor, control, and mode of production. This was created by the bourgeois of the strong Northwest European core to manipulate the world market so as to derive the maximum profit out of it to help them maintain this regional specialization and to expand to new territories for conquest and plunder. The bourgeois turned to the state since it controlled the military and the facilities to accelerate transport to distant regions, say ports for instance. The regional specialization led to the formation of three structural positions within the world economy, the core, the periphery, and the semi-periphery. As a result of what Wallerstein called a series of accidents, Northwest Europe in the 16th century had certain historical, ecological, and geographical advantage over the rest of the world, which enabled it to go beyond agricultural capitalism to manufacturing, which was beneficial to industrial capitalism, textile, ships, and metal. This led to Northwest Europe becoming the core where the needs arising from its specialization in industrial manufacturing could be met conveniently by tenancy and wage labor as modes of labor control. Mediterranean Europe emerged as the semi-periphery that specialized in industrial produce such as silk and in commercial and asset transaction. These activities could be accomplished with the help of sharecropping as the mode of labor control in the rural area. East Europe and the Western Hemisphere emerged as the periphery. They exported raw material and precious metal to the core. The production of raw material and the mining for precious metal could be carried out most conveniently by slavery and other forms of forced labor as the mode of labor control. In this way, the regional specialization created a structural hierarchy in which certain regions were considered most appropriate for particular types of industrial and agricultural activity and the resultant forms of labor control. The modern world system consolidated itself by maintaining the hierarchical distinction between and playing roles appropriate to the core periphery and semi-periphery region. The core state, for instance, were strong in terms of state machinery and military power and did not rely on any interest group within the region for their own survival. The state machinery helped the bourgeois by protecting their economic interests and providing them with monopolies in manufacturing and production, helping them withstand losses and ensuring that the peripheral areas continue to be economically dependent upon them. The semi-peripheral regions were not only important trading partners for the core, but they helped to maintain the unequal hierarchical structure of the modern world system. They did this by redirecting away from the core any collective political process against them by groups in a peripheral region. By the middle of the 17th century, these three reasons for a structural position had become integral to the world capitalist economy. Another feature of the system was that 
there existed the extraction of surplus from the whole world economy as such that is from semi periphery and the periphery to the core as mentioned earlier the states in the core region held the commercial interest of the bourgeois in the world market by using their economy and military strength to superimpose their interest on the weaker regions and forcing them to trade in a system of unequal exchange so for wallerstein the modern world system was not to be understood by studying the capitalist exchanges limited to nation state but by studying the world economy as a whole in this way wallerstein has tried to show that the modern world system which is a capitalist world system was not a 20th century phenomena but one which has existed for much longer than that the political stability of the modern world system has been sustained over the century due to the three factors number 1 the concentration of military power in the hands of the core number 2 the ruling classes the ideological commitment to the system and number 3 the division of the modern world system in such a way that there was a large periphery and a smaller semi periphery the last point for wallerstein was the most important attribute relevant for for the survival of the modern world system as it explained how the role of the semi periphery was not just economic but political as well while the core exploited the semi periphery and the periphery the semi periphery also exploited the periphery this ensured that the core did not face the unified opposition from the large majority which was in the periphery as some of that tension was diverted away by the expansion carried out by the semi periphery the ruling classes in all the three regions of the structure saw in the survival of the system their own survival in other words they believed in the myths of the modern world system which was wallerstein called the shared ideology of the ruling classes the ruling class did not feel loyalty to an ideology however they were part of the system and performed their role as specified by the regional differentiation in labor control and mode of production the modern world system cannot last forever since it is a historical structure just as its predecessor the feudal system was wallerstein notes that from the middle of the 18th century the modern world system expanded beyond europe and the americas and incorporated other regions far removed from the european core these included the indian subcontinent turkey russia and parts of africa towards the latter half of the 19th century the modern world system became an integrated geographical unit and by the end of the second world war more remote corners of the world also became incorporated into the modern world system as a result the integration of the world into one system that is world economy both labor and goods had become commodified in every part of the world however the system was not without its shares of crisis some of which could threaten its very existence one set of crisis was that what wallerstein called the cyclical crisis which occurred when there was a recession after a period of sustained growth after the recession came a new wave of growth financial unrest could create social unrest which could threaten the very existence of the system moreover tension could also arise when there was a shift in hegemonic power this happened when regions which were not originally in the core grew economically militarily and technologically thus while at the beginning of the modern world system in the 16th century the netherlands the uk and the france were hegemonic powers by the middle of the 19th century the uk was the world leader and by the end of the second world war united states of america was was and continues to be to this day the hegemonic power of the world however hegemonic status can be affected by various crises within the core which can bring about a change in global leadership according to wallerstein the most prominent threat to the capitalist world system has been socialism socialism has been made the has made the core region move towards some more just and equitable distribution of wealth in the world economy and allowed the formation of political units that challenged the capitalist world economy resulting changes in the world system and a move towards another system or transition which cannot be prevented by the modern world system after understanding the world the wallerstein theory now let's move on to world 
polity theory. The world polity theory is also called the world society theory which falls within the institutional perspective of globalization. It was developed by John Mayer and his colleagues in the 1980s in response to the prevalent comparative study perspective which focused predominantly on the modernization and dependency theory. For the institutionalist, the whole world is the environment and all the institution by the nation state or multinational corporation or any other national or international organizations are embedded within this environment. Consequently, no nation state or multinational entity can be understood in isolation. The world polity is a system in which authority does not belong to a group of officials within a nation state or to a group of officials belonging to a hegemonic nation state. Rather, the system runs on the basis of collectively recognized rules which are also called frames or models which motivate the actors in the system to act. There is no single authority to define rules within the world polity. Even though nation states are considered to be able to act with responsibility and with authority, the onus to create collective rules and goal does not lie with state official alone. There is a much larger phenomena from which the authority of the nation state derives and that is what the institutionalists called world culture. World culture is defined as universally recognized and applicable rules which define who are legitimate actors in world society and what goals they can pursue and how they can pursue them. World culture is also seen as a definition, principle and purposes which are cognitively constructed in similar way throughout the world. World culture is driven by two western themes of progress and justice which determines all other values which are given a global nature and are diffused cross nationally for implementation by nation state. Social actors are awarded for complying with universalistic models, global polity in various ways but predominantly by recognition from international organization that occupy the global civil society and space. The importance given to universalistic models results in institutional similarity amongst different nation states which is derived from an exogenous world culture which defines their identities, structure and behavior via worldwide cultural and associational process. The modern world polity origin can be traced to medieval Christendom when individuality, autonomy and rationality were values which began to be recognized as important for human well-being. By the time European society progressed towards the 20th century, the whole world had come to become a part of a unified world system bound by rules which were applicable to the system as a whole. By the end of the Second World War, international organizations such as the United Nations created and legitimated rules which defined what was acceptable behavior of responsible nation state and what was not. Mayer attributes the growth of these international organizations to the failure of the Second World War and the need for universally acceptable models and frames which emphasize nationally organized progress and justice. Finally, the collapse of the Soviet bloc and the defeat of communism in 1990 at the hands of capitalism helped to define the universalistic and systemized models of the modern polity. The model or frames of the world polity delineate three important features, the actor, the nation state, the individual organization and professionals. Number two, the purposes, that is the development and progress. And at the third level, the basic principles such as human rights, equality, liberty, justice and so on. In addition to these features, there are four elements within the world polity which ensure that these models or frames are implemented by the nation state. These elements are integral to the functioning of the world polity. They are international political organizations such as UNO, the nation state whose principles and structural similarity are diffused globally, voluntary organizations such as NGOs and experts such as scientists and professionals. The world polity theory emphasizes upon institutions whether they are political, professional, voluntary or corporate. These institutions play an important role in diffusing systematic ideas, principles and values across nation and state simply by virtue of being universalistic in nature, which is their typical feature. All the institutions in the world polity as elaborated in a previously derive their authority, value, ideas and principles from the world culture. 
the world culture emphasizes universality and similarities in values and frames for all institutions which are bound by the ideologies and values propounded by it. The world polity is not without its challenges. The world culture from which they are derived, the models and the frame which operationalized which operationalizes the world polity is itself beset by contradiction and inconsistencies. Taking two principles of world culture, human right and progress, for instance, one sees that both are at odds with one another. Progress, which might involve clearing land to build a dam for a mega power project, can mean the violation of the human rights to the light and livelihood of people living on the land. This has happened before in India is an example of it. Some actions of the government can result in international and national voluntary and political organization intervening to preserve the human rights of the vulnerable people. In this way, voluntary organizations such as grassroots organization and NGOs and international political organization bound by values derived from world culture strive to uphold these values within the boundaries of the nation state. Such active institutional involvement at a global level has the potential to create reform and can even be seen as a force of change in the world polity. This also shows that diffuse nature rather than the single centralized nature of authority in the world polity. In the world polity theory, there are two processes taking places simultaneously in globalization. That is, the world polity is a globally institutionalized one and number two, universalistic model of frames are diffused to nation state which are an integral component of world polity. Therefore, globalization is not just the opening up of a country to outside influences or the increasing integration of the world. It is also the process whereby ideas and practices are institutionalized at the global level. The global level is beyond the international level and is more expansive in meaning and form than the international sphere. The occurrence of these two simultaneous processes in globalization suggests that certain universal values relating to the environment, education, public health and human right to name are few, but are diffused from the global court to the national level. According to the world policy theory, all actors, that is nation state, organization and professionals are embedded within an institutional environment and the basis of their legitimacy is cultural. There is no single authoritative nation state or global state or a centralized authoritative system. In the world polity, the needs within nation state and even social change are agreed upon by world culture. Activities within the nation state as well as globally prescribed values can sometimes push the nation state to a corner with local group going against some of the policies of the nation state which might be contrary to globally prescribed values of world culture. Therefore, sometimes needs of a nation state are decoupled from the universalistic model prescribed by world culture due to the dualistic nature of these needs, that is with the boundaries between the national and the global blurring. All issues which are given global legitimacy by the world culture are based on two rationals, rationalization and actorhood. Rationalization refers to the standardization of social life. It is the basis for organizing on a global scale and emphasize the universality of these global norms. Actorhood refers to the agency of the social actor to take part and act upon globally mandated issues in a decentralized manner. This is yet another aspect of world polity in that nation state have their autonomy again derived from the world culture. The world polity is prone to transformation due to many factors. Firstly, there is no single nation state or other rationalized actor which has absolute authority over world culture. This means that world culture can have many variants and undergo changes in the absence of control by any one nation state. Secondly, the structural similarities between nation and state in global polity mean that they pursue similar end which can increase conflict and competition between them. Thirdly, the social actors which are legitimized by world culture can have conflicting interest as well. The institutional perspective on globalization is credited with adding one more level that is global to the ones already existing within the comparative studies perspective that is international and transnational. 
The redefinition of globalization is a shift from traditional notion of globalization as a process which is limited to a greater integration amongst countries and increased flow of commodities, capital and people. The shift proposed by institutionalists emphasized the universal or the global. In this perspective, globalization is seen not just as an economic or political process but a cultural one. Let's now understand network society. Manuel Castle defines network society as a society whose social structure is made of networks powered by microelectronic based information and communication technologies. Networks are units which are composed of nodes which intersect. Not all nodes are equally important for the network. The importance of node depends upon the degree to which it can be absorbed and processed efficiently. The more relevant information which is available outside the network while all nodes are required for the network to function efficiently, the importance of a node is directly proportional to its contribution to the goals of the network. However, when nodes stop contributing to the network goals and become redundant, the network reconfigures itself where it deletes the redundant nodes and adds new one for the optimum performance of the network. A social network is not characterized by a single network but a multiplicity of network which are constantly cooperating and competing. A network is distinguished by its goal and the rules it follows to attain the goal. The goal of a network are assigned to it by its program which is a set of code which assesses the performance of the network and gauges that constitute success and failure in reaching goal. In order to change the outcome of a goals of a network, a new program will need to be installed into the network from outside. Network functions on the basis of binary logic which consists of inclusion and exclusion of nodes. Castle notes that the network are not unique to human organization. Wherever there is a life, there are networks. The advent of the modern transport and communication facilities during the time of the Industrial Revolution resulted in the emergence of quasi-global network with self-reconfiguring capacity. While organization in the industrial age were hierarchical, vertical and centralized structure, Networks are autonomous structure. Network are the most efficient of all organizational form for Castle because of three features, flexibility, scalability, and survivability. Network in their present form owe their existence to microelectric revolution that took place in the 1940s and 1950s in the USA. The microelectric revolution expanded the potential of information and communication technology and became the basis of what Castle calls the technological paradigm which consolidated itself in 1970s, mainly in the USA. By technology, Castle is referring specifically to information and communication technology. The potential of information and communication technology in network society to allow social unit to organize and interact with one another or network is limitless compared to earlier industrial age where network to this extent was not possible. Informationalism is a technological paradigm which is created by increased capacity and pace of human to process and communicate information with the help of revolution in microelectronics. The crisis of industrial society can be explained in terms of the failure of the Keynesian principle of capitalism. In 1970s America and the rise of neoliberal policies to circumvent this failure. With the failure of Soviet inspired communism in the 1990s, more parts of the world were bound by the western neoliberal model of capitalism. In time, neoliberal policy resulted in an increased investment in various kinds of technologies including those around which new technological paradigm was structured. The network society continued the freedom movement of the late 1960s and 1970s challenged the existing social structure and attempted to project a more egalitarian social structure which would recognize and protect individual autonomy vis-a-vis -vis all the established institutions of the day. While we have already discussed the revolution in information and communication technology, Castle notes that it occurred independently from the crisis in industrialism and the freedom movement that took place in the 1960s. and the 60s. How did these three processes interact with each other? On one hand, business and large corporations themselves made ample use of information and communication technology to improve their own productivity and expand the scale of their business. The world of research scientists and innovator of network society which has resulted in greater networking decentralization, openness and instant connectivity between individual and organization in real time around the world is in direct contrast to the culture of secrecy, centralization of power, 
hierarchical and intellectual property rights, which were the source of power and wealth of large corporate industrial society. Castle notes that network society is characterized by a new division of labor, which features a distinction between self-programmable labor and generic labor. Moreover, the concept of time and space in a network society acquire a special nature. According to Castle, he uses the term space of flows and timeless time to describe them. Castle explains that in a society based on digital technology, the concept of space and time undergoes a change. It is possible to perform multiple activities simultaneously by staying in the same location. As far as time is concerned, it is defined as socially the sequencing of practices and biologically in terms of life cycle in nature. To conclude for Castle, just as digital networks are global in nature, a social structure based on digital technology is by definition global. Now let's understand transnationalism. Transnationalism is a phenomena which is used to describe the numerous bonds that connect people and institutions across borders or country. There are different aspects which are used to describe transnationalism and they vary greatly in nature. One aspect has to do with the increased movement of people across borders or migration. Migration as we know can be of various reasons. While some thinkers note that diaspora have multiple identity which in itself is an empowering notion, others believe that ever expanding movement of people have resulted into loosening bonds between people and homeland. The existence of multiple identity has also resulted in redefining the traditional notion of the state as a legally recognized political unit whose citizens are united by certain common primordial factor such as language or religion. The second aspect of transnationalism refers to the flow of capital across border and its implication. The major institutional player in the flow of capital is the transnational corporation or the TNC whose area of operation spans the entire globe. Sclears has noted the existence of transnational capitalist class TCC which is a modern bourgeois albeit on a larger scale. The TCC consists of industrialists, politicians, bureaucrat, professionals and the media who compose the global ruling class. Appa Durai focuses on the cultural impact of transnational or global flow of people, technology, money, information and idea. He describes scapes or flow as a characteristic feature of globalization and as a phenomena that produce cultural hybrid the world over. These scapes are ethnoscape, technoscape, finance scape, media scape and ideoscape. Appa Durai uses the term scape in common here to explain a construct which is based not on objective criteria but deferred according to the perspective one is looking at the construct from. In other words, scapes refer to construct which are transformed according to an actor's specific background. Actors can mean individual, nation state, transnational corporation and so on. Ethnoscape comprises of a collective that either fantasizes about moving out of their home country to a desired country of destination or copes with the reality of actually having to move from their home country. Example of ethnoscape are ethnic diaspora and migrant workers. Technoscape refers to all types of technology which have gained fluidity and move quickly within and across territories. Financecape refers to the flow of capital between institutions and people across nation state. The dominating presence of MNCs and TNC is a reflection of financecape. Mediascape refers to the flow of information between nation state. The information can be of various type. News, breakthrough in scientific research, images from popular culture and so on. Ideascape comprises all the ideas, concepts and images which are projected by the mediascape. Though these scapes are independent construct, they are constantly interacting with each other. The expanding reach of globalization has resulted in the forging of multiple transnational connections between individual institutions across nation state. Now let's come to world city theory. The world city framework is the contribution of urbanists to the globalization debate. The two most renowned thinkers are John Friedman and Saskia Sassan. World city literature is a broad field. Put simply, it tries to study the effect of global economy on cities. How do the activities taking place in the global economy affect the form and structure of cities? How do they alter cities and how do they forge connection between cities? 
Though the term World City throws up images of globally connected urban conglomerate, it was coined by Patrick Giddes in his work titled Cities in Evolution, published in 1915. However, more recent interest in the topic was generated by Peter Hall, who in the year 1996 in his work titled The World Cities tried to distinguish world cities or great cities from other cities. According to him, world cities are where political power is concentrated. By political power, he means national, municipal, and even international authority. Around this political center congregate institution, mainly financial, that do business with the government. Leading financial organizations of the world are also found in this world city. Moreover, they rank high in regard to public service facilities such as education and transport, research, development and technology, and functional as cultural hub as well. According to Friedman, the world city hypothesis is neither a theory nor a universal generalization about cities, but a loosely joined statement primarily intended as a framework of research. Friedman discusses seven interrelated theses which explain the forms and structure of city within the world economy and the international division of labor. These are structural changes depends upon degree of integration of a city with the world economy and its function in the international division of labor. Number two, world cities are hierarchically arranged. Number three, production and employment in world cities determine the extent of the global financial and political control. Number four, international capital concentrates and accumulates in world cities. Number five, domestic and international migrant consider world cities to be significant place of destination. Number six, growth of world cities highlights spatial and class division. And lastly, social costs of these divisions tend to exceed the fiscal capacity of the state. Saskia Sassen has noted that multinational cooperation also play a role in the practice of global control. World city theorists like Sassen believe that global economy is bound by territory in which the city is most important component. According to Sassen, globalization process not only invokes big corporates and professionals, but also immigrant economy, the informal economy and so on. Both Friedman and Sassen believe that the world city is a product of the global system which has superimposed itself on nation state. The world city system is a product of globalization as it goes beyond the national. In today's lesson, we saw that globalization was not meaning one and the same thing. The definition of globalization is not about homogenization. We look and saw in the beginning what do we understand by the term globalization the way it is understood was varied to begin the module we started with world system analysis and we saw that how wallerstein in his theory looks at it in a very very different way later on john mayer in his world polity theory takes a different stance which is in contrast to world system analyst. The Manuel Castle looks at it in terms of a network society. In adding to the three world system, world polity and network society, there was also an perspective which we discussed under the rubrics of transnationalism. And the most recent which has been talked about first by Patrick Giddes and then by Friedman is that of world city theory. Dear students, in this module on contested character of globalization, it is these five perspectives which are contesting each other's understanding of globalization. Remember, it is not any one of these in particular in specific but a general understanding arrived out of these five that is the world system analyst the world policy theory the network society transnationalism and world city theory that we come to understand the phenomena of globalization hope you enjoyed the lecture thank you